starts right now. We begin tonight with late breaking news. Several people in custody after San Antonio police made a gambling bust on the south side of town. They were called out to a home near South Pressa in Loop 410. The night team's Jaffney Gray is there now. And Jaffney, we're learning that uh, finding this gambling operation came as a surprise. Tim, that's right. San Antonio police say they initially got the call that someone had been shot, but when they got to this location, they were caught off guard by the number of people running and scrambling away from a home that's behind what appears to be a vacant building. Now, police ended up catching and detaining at least 12 people. When they got inside the home, they were searching for someone injured. Instead, they found 15 to 28 liner gambling machines. No one was injured. A sergeant on scene says that they are beginning to find more of these gambling operations within the city instead of out in the county like usual. Now, Vice just arrived not too long ago to continue this investigation into this gambling operation. Again, nobody has been arrested at this time, but 12 people detained and interviewed. At this time, the homeowner nowhere to be found. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Daphne. New on the night beat, a Southside family in shock after a fire destroyed their home, leaving them with almost nothing. The fire broke out off Sierra Street. The family able to make it out safely, but they are now wondering where they'll go next. Night team Stephen Cavazos with how they plan to move forward. I don't know. I'm lost for words right now. <laughs> Valerie Cruz struggling to come to terms with a new reality after a fire destroyed her home off Sierra Street, where she lived for 15 years. It's something that you would see in the movies basically just happen in, in an instant. The fire broke out last night. The San Antonio Fire Department says flames were seen coming from the left side of the house. Cruz says her nephew was sleeping next to a window when he felt the heat coming from outside. Sure enough, it was it. We saw it. We ran back into the bedroom and we got everybody out. Cruz suspicious over how the fire started. There's no electricity outside to where it could have sparked. Nothing, nothing at all. No cause has been determined, but fire officials say the home is a total loss. The family left with next to nothing. Crews uncertain of the days ahead. We don't know where to go exactly. Cruz says she is certain saying goodbye to her home will be difficult. A home that gave her family so many memories. It's, it's, it's been a home for me for as many years and it's, it's hard. Now, fire crews did add that there was lumber stored in the area where the fire broke out. They say arson is still investigating. Red Cross has stepped in to help that family. Tim. Thank you, Stephen. Neighbors living on the southeast side are hoping the person responsible for shooting and injuring an elderly woman this afternoon turns themselves in. That woman is recovering in the hospital tonight. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with neighbors and a family member of the victim. She tells us why they say they're sick of gun violence. I just hear boom, 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 boom. So obvious, I jump on the floor. After the seventh shot, we got down. Neighbors in this southeast side neighborhood living along Burr Oak Path, troubled by a drive-by shooting San Antonio police say happened around 2.30. Antonio Hamilton says he was asleep when one of the bullets flew right above his head. Fortunately, he was uninjured. However, his neighbor, an elderly woman next door, wasn't so lucky. We were able to get down on the ground low enough, um, but my aunt unfortunately was not. Police say she was shot in the leg. The injured woman's niece, who asked not to be identified, also had her seven-year-old son in the house at the time of the shooting. You never know what can happen out of it. You never know whose life, I mean, even if you're going after a certain person, I mean, look what happened. After the shooting, Hamilton says he walked outside and noticed the aftermath of the gunfire. Just to give you an idea of how much damage was done, check out Mr. Hamilton's property. His back tire of this vehicle shot out. But look at the red vehicle up here. Another bullet hole right under that sticker you see there. And again, it's not just his property. Look at his neighbor's property. That bullet hole right above that tire on that vehicle. Get rid of these guns and let's, you know, use the fist again because uh, these bullets don't have names. They hit anybody. The woman was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. They did this in broad daylight with kids outside, so whoever did it, I hope they catch you. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. A look at some other top stories on this Saturday. A man told police he led them on a chase and fired an AK-47 while on the highway to blow off steam after his girlfriend broke up with him. That man had reportedly just left a gun range and when he was spotted by a DPS helicopter near I-35 and Weedner Road, he was firing several rounds. The helicopter and SAPD then followed that suspect who was apparently waving a handgun out the window. 
The pursuit ended on Misty Run and the man led officers right to his house. They arrested him at the front door. He's now facing an evading arrest and unlawfully firing a weapon in a municipality charge. A man is in critical condition after suffering a gunshot wound before crashing into a light pole. This all happened just after midnight over on Vance Jackson Road. Police say the man drove off the roadway and crashed into the light pole. That's when a person who was passing by noticed the crash and pulled over to help. They then found the driver had a gunshot wound and informed police. The driver later taken to the hospital. It's unclear right now uh, when or where that person was shot. The incident remains under investigation. To the latest now on the coronavirus outbreak here in Texas, Memorial Herman Hospital in Houston announcing this afternoon it's asked 11 health care workers who are in direct contact with one of the confirmed patients there to self quarantine for 14 days. During a press conference today, hospital officials said the health care workers were reportedly notified of the possible exposure of coronavirus yesterday. They also announced some of the workers are exhibiting minor symptoms, but all have been or will be tested. This follows two more presumptive positive cases of coronavirus in Fort Bend County yesterday. That brings the total of cases in the Houston area to eight, all of which officials say are connected to a group who traveled to Egypt last month. Meanwhile, here in San Antonio, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention confirms two coronavirus patients were discharged from a local medical facility and were able to return home. Both of those patients were quarantined Diamond Princess cruise ship passengers and met the criteria for discharge, according to the CDC. One of the patients was released Thursday night. The other released yesterday morning. A Diamond Princess evacuee also completed an extended quarantine at JBSA Lackland on Thursday. If you're looking for a complete guide to all things coronavirus, KSAT has you covered. Right now on KSAT.com, you can find reliable resources on everything from preventing and preparing for coronavirus to testing, local resources, and fact-checking. All the links we've gathered include helpful information from health and community experts. Just look for the story posted on our homepage. We'll have more on the coronavirus coming up in our next half hour. Taking a look outside with live cam tonight. It was great to see those clouds clear out late this afternoon. It made for a nice but cool evening. We're in the mid 50s now and temperatures will continue to fall a few more degrees over the next few hours before clouds fill in overnight. And by now you've undoubtedly heard that yes, we spring forward tonight. So don't forget as the clock strike 2 a.m. tomorrow morning. They're quickly going to jump ahead to 3 a.m. So yes, this is the one where we lose an hour of sleep and I have the sleeping cat on here, but who are we kidding? The cats don't sleep in the middle of the night. Everyone knows that that's for sure. Uh, so I hope maybe you can uh, sleep in a little bit tomorrow morning. We'll see the clouds return tomorrow and also low in chances of rain. More on that in your spring break week forecast coming up in just a bit. Tim. 3 a.m. The well-known witching hour for cats. Hundreds gathered today to bring awareness and raise funds for multiple sclerosis at this year's Walk MS San Antonio 2020. This morning, Alicia Barrera was at that walk and spoke with participants. A thousand people lined up against one enemy, multiple sclerosis. Some walking, some running, and all honoring a community of victims whose diagnosis is often painful, confusing, or isolating. And with any disease, uh, it's something you don't know how you're going to deal with. It's, it's depressing. You kind of get in a funk. Like Chris, some people may be symptom-free most of their lives. When I was 15, um, I was hospitalized for three days. I couldn't walk and the doctors couldn't figure out what at that point. And at that time, um, MS was not really well known. He wasn't formally diagnosed with relapse remitting MS until he was 30 years old. But I lost vision in uh, one side of my eye. His sight was restored thanks to the treatment available. But the fear of another MS flare up is something Master Sergeant Herbert Robles knows all too well. The way we found out that we had MS was my wife lost her eyesight. Um, and to, for somebody to wake up one morning and not be able to see, uh, is a terrifying experience. He says her eyesight has returned, but other families at today's walk are dealing with a form of MS that keeps getting worse, eventually robbing victims of all mobility. Robles says he and others walk to help those victims and to do whatever they can to bring hope. Okay, so we have brought 58 cadets from Central Catholic High School JRTC program. It's extra special. And of course, all of them come up, hey, Master Sergeant, we're, we're going to do this next year. We know that your situation, we know what's going on with your wife. Uh, they're, they're great. They're loving kids. 
The money raised through the MS Walk helps fund research, not only in San Antonio, but abroad. We work together with the MS Inter International Federation um, to fund the most promising research that's out there. We've been able to fund a lot of new medications, disease-modifying treatments that are available to those that are living with MS. And the push to educate more people continues as MS Awareness Week, a national effort, begins tomorrow and wraps up on March 14th. You can head over to ksat.com to learn more about this disease, resources available to those diagnosed with MS, as well as how to make a donation. Reporting, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead on the night beat, the number of those infected by coronavirus worldwide now soars past 100,000. The latest on the growing crisis abroad and here at home. Plus, volunteers come out in droves this weekend to help with recovery efforts in Tennessee. We'll take you there. Turning to politics now, the two Democratic frontrunners are battling it out, concentrating on Midwestern states, which have primaries coming this Tuesday. The last woman in the race, Tulsi Gabbard, says she is staying in, but a rule change by the DNC will prevent her from participating in the next debate. Here's ABC's Yuni Han with the details. With the next round of primary set for this coming Tuesday, the Democratic candidates and their surrogates are out on the campaign trail this weekend. He thinks that he's going to win re-election by dividing us up. We are going to beat him because we're bringing our people together. The Vermont senator focusing on the Midwest, speaking to supporters in Michigan. And all over this country, people are asking themselves which candidate can best defeat Trump. I have zero doubt in my mind that together we are the campaign that could beat Trump. The traditional battleground state has the most delegates up for grabs on Tuesday when voters in six states head to the polls. Senator Amy Klobuchar is also in Michigan, lending her voice to former Vice President Joe Biden's campaign. She dropped out of the race before Super Tuesday and then endorsed him. We are going to build a beautiful blue wall of Democratic votes around the Midwest. And we are going to make Donald Trump pay for it. Former Secretary of State John Kerry also campaigning for the former vice president. This man is smiling at you from the wall on both sides. I uh, know him well. He has the ability to get this done. He's going to be the next president of the United States. Biden continues to ride the momentum after winning 10 states on Super Tuesday, his campaign raising $22 million since Tuesday. Oh, Senator Sanders likes to say he'll need a record turnout to defeat Donald Trump. He's right. And we're the campaign that's going to do that record turnout. He's also racked up endorsements from eight of his former rivals. The last female candidate in the race, Hawaii Representative Tulsi Gabbard. She says she's staying in the race despite no viable path to victory. A rule change by the Democratic National Committee will exclude her from the next debate in Phoenix on March 15th. She's calling on the two frontrunners to stand up for what's right and help her get on that stage. Yuni Han, ABC News, New York. We have some more late-breaking news to tell you about now. Police are looking for two suspects following a shooting over on the south side where one person was sent to the hospital. It happened in the 6100 block of Bark Valley. Police say one of the suspects and the victim got into a fight. The second suspect intervened and shot the victim in the lane in the leg rather. The 28 year old victim was transported to University Hospital with non life threatening injuries. Police described the two suspects as male in their late teens and mid 20s. We'll continue following this for you and provide more updates online and on air as they become available. Turning to weather now, uh, started out kind of gray and yeah. cool, but the sun did come out. We improved, we improved really quickly. Yes. Yeah, late this afternoon and early this evening, saw a lot of folks out and about around the mm -hmm. Pearl and Broadway area, hopefully enjoying the present, uh, pleasant weather, but you did need a jacket or a sweater. It got awfully cool out there this evening. We're sitting in the mid 50s right now, and I want to show you the time lapse from today. Starting this morning, a lot of mid and upper level cloud cover. We had a weak piece of upper level energy moving in overhead that resulted in a little bit of very light rain for some folks and a lot of cloud cover for all of us, but we cleared out really quickly. You, you can see the change in the wind direction as those clouds moved out and they were out of here this evening. 49 the morning low up to 65 here in San Antonio because of the cloud cover. If you were stuck with more clouds through the course of the day, that kept you a little bit cooler. But those of you that cleared out earlier, Del Rio down in Carrizo Springs, Catula, 
Uvalde, you were able to sneak in uh, to the mid to upper 70s in some cases this afternoon. So that was the difference in our temperatures today. It all had to do with that cloud cover. We should see more uniform temperatures tomorrow because all of us will be stuck with more cloud cover through the duration of the day on Sunday. Out there right now, we've got 60s off to the west, 58 Uvalde, 52 in New Braunfels, 51 in Kerrville. And just as quickly as the clouds exited, to the east, we are going to see there's that weak disturbance that moved through today with the cloud cover. It's already moving into Mississippi and Alabama tonight. But just as quickly as those clouds moved out to the east, we've got more cloud cover that will pour in from the west tonight. This is a lot in the mid and high level clouds, just like what we saw today. But we'll also see the return of low cloud cover late tonight through early tomorrow morning. And I, I want to show you as the clouds fill in across Texas late tonight and early tomorrow morning uh, where there will be better chances of rain as we get into the day tomorrow. And if you have, you know, this next week off for spring break, the kiddos are off and you're heading out of town. This will kind of give you an idea of what to expect across Texas during the day tomorrow. Clouds will be filling in by tomorrow morning. It's cloudy up in the Metroplex and in the Panhandle as well. And then as we get into the afternoon, you'll start to notice some rain working into the western portion of the state and a lot of the rain tomorrow will be focused just off to our north uh, and to our west with better chances of rain up closer to the DFW area. But there is going to be a little batch of rain working into central Texas that I think could offer us here in San Antonio about a 20% chance at a passing isolated shower uh, during the day tomorrow. So let's zoom in back closer to home and look at your future cast by tomorrow morning. The clouds are back. It will be gray, especially through the first half of the day. I do think we could pull off maybe a little bit of clearing some peaks of sun tomorrow afternoon, but not like the clearing that we saw today. And here's a little batch of rain that we'll be working in off to the northwest of San Antonio. So the hill country, you have a better chance to see one of these showers beginning tomorrow afternoon and into the evening, but I can't rule out that one of these very light showers can make it as far south as San Antonio tomorrow uh, and even into late tomorrow evening by 11 p.m. tomorrow. There's some more rain working in, but I think that will be a bit too far off to the northwest to really help us out with any good chances of rain or thunderstorms. So we'll keep a low 20% chance of an isolated passing shower in the forecast through Monday. So we'll look at your day tomorrow, a few degrees warmer, but not by much because we are just going to hold on to a lot of cloud cover uh, into the afternoon. A 20% chance of rain lingers into Monday, but a nice warming trend heading into the middle of next week. Spring break is going to be feeling very spring like and you'll notice toward the end of the week. First part of next weekend, some slightly better chances of rain. We'll talk more about that and maybe our next pattern change coming up next half hour. A real nice weather to be on spring break. Yeah, it is. All right, thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. Some local high school teams chasing state tournament dreams. Brandeis boys basketball beat a very good Judson team today, and in the process, Brandeis made history, advancing to state for the very first time. And Veterans Memorial, unfortunately, came up short in the 5A state title contest. Coming up. beat in the first round last year and from that next day on they've been working for this moment so I'm super happy and proud for them. Head coach Mark Gardner and the Brandeis Broncos made school history clinching their first ever trip to the state tournament in big board sports. In high school girls basketball veterans memorial faced Frisco Liberty for the 5A state championship at the Elmo Dome and unfortunately the Lady Patriots fell short. They led 11 to 6 after one but trailed 15 13 and halftime scoring just one bucket in the second quarter. Veterans Memorial opened the third with a 5-0 run to go up 18-15, but they went ice cold the final 6-08 and trailed 21-18 after three. Fourth quarter, Sahara Jones makes a three plus the foul, and she is super excited. Four-point play got them within three, but Frisco Liberty holds on to win 35-26. Jones scored a game-high 15 for the Pats. I just heard them to keep their heads up high, that it's okay, it's not nothing personal against us, just everything isn't going to be perfect all the time. So I say, like, when they say take the picture, I just say, let's huddle one more time and just smile. Veterans Memorial finishes the season 32 and 8 and state runner up. Last night in Class 6A, the Judson Rockets lost to Duncanville in the state semifinals, coming up short in their bid to repeat. Judson fell behind 6 0 in the first quarter and played from behind the entire game. They fought and clawed back, getting within three late in the third, but could never get over the hump. Kiera Sanderlin scored a game best 18 for the Rockets.
It was really fast. Um, we weren't quite handling the ball very well, um, and that kind of sped us up, and we um, kind of didn't hold our composure as we've been doing, and we just all over the place this game. Rockets in their season with a 33-9 overall record. Meanwhile, the Judson boys basketball team is one of seven teams competing this afternoon for trips to next week's state tournament, taking on Brandeis in the Class 6A regional final. It's all Broncos in the second half. Ty Fontenot scores a quick two, and it's 55-40 Brandeis. Then Tanner Brown knifes his way to the basket and gets the tough layup to fall counted and one Broncos lead by as many as 19 in the fourth quarter. Judson not done, though. Keontae Holder weaves his way through the defense for the basket. The Rockets claw their way back into it, just down five, but Brandeis holds them off. Fontenot to Kyle Schaefer on the break for the lay-in, and for the first time in school history, the Broncos are heading to state. 75-68 is the final. It was so exciting. Like we've been working for that all year, and we just day one, day one of practice, we said, you know, we have the potential to go to state, and so that was just so such a great feeling. It's a dream come true. It's something we've been talking about since we were kids, and it's finally, it's finally here, man. We, we, I mean, first, first team, first major sport in Brandeis history to ever go to state, and we, we made history today. So that, that's a great feeling. That's pretty darn cool. The Broncos will take on Duncanville in the Class 6A state semifinals Friday night at 7. Northside Sports Gym is packed for the Class 5A regional final. Harlan facing Wagner. Thunderbirds battling back from an early deficit. Journey Phillips gets the floater to rattle in, and Wagner still down 11-10. Hawks respond right away. Jalen Mangum pulls up and banks in the jumper, getting fired up. Harlan leads 15-13 after one. Second quarter, Wagner takes control. Joshua Cobbs gets the rebound and put back plus the foul. Thunderbirds are heading back to state 64. 48. Class 3A Regional, final up in Seguin. Cole taking on Universal City Randolph, and the Rohawks take control early. Jaden Arthur with a nice feed to a cutting Logan Bracamonte for the lay-in. Randolph jumps out to a 5-0 lead, but the Cougars answer back. Andrew Reed drills the triple, and Cole rallies in the second half, and the Cougars come back to win a close one, 33-31, so they're heading to state, and in Class 4A, Bernie falls to Stafford, 49 48 and coming up later in sports we're talking NBA coach pop was not pleased with his starters last night in that embarrassing loss that means we saw a lot of the young guys we did indeed all right we'll see a little bit more of that later thanks Larry <laughs> next on the night beat the latest developments in the ongoing coronavirus crisis including a new emergency declaration and a massive effort to help pick up the pieces in Tennessee following a series of deadly tornadoes The coronavirus outbreak continues to spread. New York's governor declaring a state of emergency and at least 29 states now with confirmed cases of the virus. This is another cruise ship now unable to dock after 21 people on board tested positive. Here's ABC's Lionel Moyes with the latest. More than 105,000 people across 101 countries have been infected by novel coronavirus. Italy's special commissioner for coronavirus announcing the number of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 has surpassed 5,000. At least 45 people testing positive for the virus on board this cruise ship on the Nile River in Egypt and officials in Bethlehem disinfecting a hotel where 14 Americans are quarantined. Rescuers in China working to free dozens of people trapped after a hotel used as a coronavirus quarantine center collapsed. And here at home, at least 29 states and the District of Columbia have COVID-19 infections with new cases in California, Oregon, and the first case of community spread in Nebraska. A state of emergency declared in New York State and in Connecticut, health officials say a physician there has tested positive for the virus. At that time, the, the, the physician displayed no symptoms associated with COVID-19. In Washington state, at least 16 deaths reported, a majority of them connected to a nursing care facility. When you look at this nursing home outbreak situation, it's about isolating the ill. It's about contact tracing to try to figure out who else may be at risk. And again, testing everyone, the testing is key. The Grand Princess cruise ship still circling off the coast of California, at least 21 people on board testing positive. We're just hoping and praying that we test negative and that somehow this ship can get offloaded in time to get home. Plans to quarantine those passengers on land still not finalized. Lionel Moyes, ABC News, New York.
In China overnight, a hotel building in a southeastern city housing quarantine coronavirus patients collapsed, as you just saw in that story. According to the Ministry of Emergency Management, 43 people have been rescued so far, but many more are still trapped tonight. The fire department says there are hundreds of firefighters and rescue dogs still on scene manning rescue efforts. It is unknown if there are any deaths at this time. The cause of the building collapse remains unknown. Stanford University following in the footsteps of South by Southwest in canceling classes because of coronavirus concerns. In a letter, the school announced it will have no more in-person classes for its winter quarter. Students will instead take final exams as take-home tests. The university has also canceled campus tours. There are currently at least 24 confirmed coronavirus cases in Northern California's Santa Clara County, where Stanford is located. Meanwhile, the entire state of California is dealing with at least 69 cases of that virus. Uber is offering its drivers paid sick leave should they come down with coronavirus. The rideshare service says drivers or delivery people would be eligible for up to 14 days of paid time off sick. Uh, if they're sick. Uh, the same goes for those who are placed in quarantine. Uber's announcement represents a policy change for the company, which primarily sees its workforce as independent contractors. Competitor Lyft said it will also provide funds to drivers should they be diagnosed. Volunteers from all over are stepping up to lend a helping hand in Nashville and its surrounding areas following those deadly tornadoes earlier this week. Here you can see hundreds of those volunteers who turned out to help recovery efforts in Nashville this weekend. The National Weather Service there says uh, at least four separate tornadoes hit the area, killing 25 and causing damage across more than 74 miles. Wind speeds reaching 175 miles per hour in some areas, with the largest tornado reported as an EF4 in Cookville, which is east of Nashville. The EF3 tornado that hit Nashville traveled approximately 60 miles through North Nashville, Germany, Town and East Nashville. Looking around the world for a bit of lighter news, folks living in a small Italian town north of Florence recently dealt with a plumbing issue many of us might not mind having. As you can see here, red wine was flowing from several faucets in that town. It happened for a few hours on Wednesday. A malfunction at a local winery apparently sent 1,000 liters of wine through the water pipes of about 20 homes. The wine flowed from faucets and shower heads for a few hours. The town's deputy mayor admitted the glitch was a moment of levity for Italians dealing with the coronavirus outbreak, which has hit hard in northern Italy. Still ahead, the pros and cons of a new app designed to help you save big on some of your more expensive medications. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. Your prescriptions and your privacy. GoodRx is an app that can save you hundreds of dollars on your medications, but there could be a downside. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz says an investigation found the app can also share some of your personal data with Google, Facebook, and other marketing companies. GoodRx finds prices and discount coupons on every prescription. Millions of people have downloaded the GoodRx app. The price comparisons and coupons can be big money savers, helping people, especially uninsured people, afford their prescriptions. That's why Consumer Reports has recommended it. But now a CR investigation finds the app is sending personal details about its users to more than 20 Internet-based companies. Our investigators in the Consumer Reports Digital Lab looked at GoodRx and found the app and the company's website sending personal information including the names of drugs that consumers were looking at, to Facebook, Google, and a company called Braze, along with other details that could be used to identify individual people. Braze told CR the data collected is not shared with data brokers or advertising companies. Both Google and Facebook deny using prescription information for targeting individuals with ads. After CR published its findings, GoodRx said it would not share personal medical information with Facebook. GoodRx also said it was careful with consumer data and that it makes most of its revenue through referral fees when consumers fill prescriptions using their coupons rather than advertising. You may still want to use GoodRx to save money, but there are some other ways too. Be sure to ask about generics and ask the pharmacist if he has any coupons. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News.
Looking outside with live cam tonight. We've had clear skies this evening as the clouds from earlier in the day have moved on out, but more clouds will be filling in right behind over the next several hours. 55 degrees our air temperature here in San Antonio, but let's talk about dew points for a second. This is the measure of moisture in the air, and for the past couple of days, dew points have not been an issue because they've been so low. And even right now, we've got dew points in the 40s, which if you look over on our dew point scale is in the dry range. But over the past 24 hours, a lot of us are seeing dew point numbers climb. Our dew point right now is 17 degrees higher in San Antonio than it was this time last night, and this is a sign of things to come. Tomorrow still pretty comfortable, but next week for spring break dew points in the 60s, that means it is going to feel very muggy out there. We'll talk more about your spring break week forecast coming up in just a few minutes. If you happen to be like me and have a lot of live oak trees around your house, you're currently dealing with second fall, which is what I spent my two days off doing, picking up leaves. Yeah. 24 hours later, it looked like I did nothing in my yard. But uh, <laughs> right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you have better uh, plans for spring break than uh, picking up leaves. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. It's a good time to, you know, if the kids are home, put them to work, a little bit there of spring go. cleaning. Yeah. If you are staying uh, here with us here in San Antonio next week for spring break, we've got a lot of our school districts off next week. It's going to be feeling very spring like out there. This is kind of your spring break planner at a glance. I don't expect rain to give you really any issues at all. We've got a 20% chance of a shower Monday. We'll pick back up with some low end rain chances toward the end of the week. But the bigger story is the humidity that we just talked about a couple minutes ago and also a lot of spring like warmth settling in next week. And Honestly, it's kind of a toss up here because for spring break, you want folks to be able to go out to our local attractions, enjoy things like that. And rain can sometimes hamper that. But we really, really need some rain, especially south of the Highway 90 corridor here in San Antonio. This is the latest drought monitor. This is updated each Thursday, so this came out just a couple days ago. Uh, hill country and areas just to the northwest of San Antonio, things are OK. But where you see this red here, this bright red color, that is indicating extreme drought conditions and that is just one tier below um, kind of the highest uh, drought conditions that we have here. So we go from the yellow that's dry, that's just kind of drier earth and then moderate drought and that deep red that thankfully we don't have on the map just yet is as bad as it gets. And a lot of our areas, especially off to the south and west, are just one notch below that. So rain would be most welcome. Unfortunately, uh, our weather pattern is just not conducive to bringing us good, healthy, widespread rainfall as we get into next week. And I'm showing you the steering flow. And when we look at this, we want to see the colors, the blues and the greens drop down into Texas. That indicates upper level low pressure systems that typically help us out with fronts or better chances of rain. And as we get into Monday and Tuesday, we've got more orange and yellow here, uh, indicating that we just don't have any weather makers moving into Texas this week. It's going to be very, very quiet, which is a bit odd considering that we're getting into the spring seasons. Typically, this is a bit more active, especially for the plains in the south in terms of severe weather, but it looks to be fairly quiet this week and no fronts coming through here at home. As we get closer to the end of the week next week, that's when our next low pressure system will be approaching from the west, and that's when we'll start to see a bit of an uptick in our rain chances. But I think even that the best rain making energy with that low will miss us well to the north. So through the next seven days or so, not looking great when it comes to rain. And because of that, that also means we've got a lot of warmth that will be building into Texas here. Look at all the blue on the map indicating colder air that is staying up in the central and northern plains. It's going to have a hard time getting down to Texas, and that means we're going to see some very spring like air settle in here. A low 70s on Monday, but a quick trek into the low to mid 80s as we get into the middle and back half of next week. So means it will be nice to get outside and enjoy if you'll be hanging, hanging out with us here at home. Don't forget we spring forward tonight, a 20% chance of a shower tomorrow into Monday. Most of us miss out on the rain. Humidity really starting to settle in by Monday and it'll be with us all next week without a cool front coming through. That humidity is not going anywhere and it's going to be Feeling pretty muggy out there, especially toward the end of the week. We'll pick back up with a 30% chance of rain Friday into Saturday. That's when that next low pressure system will be getting closer to us, and hopefully we'll be able to bump those rain chances up a bit in the coming days. Spring has sprung. Yes, it has. All right, thanks, Katie. Coach Pop, not happy last night. No, the Spurs 
four minutes into the game at the Nets, they were already down by 10 points, and they trailed by as many, I think, as 22 in the first quarter. So Pop not pleased with his starting five. And in soccer, SAFC picked up three points on opening night coming up. I thought those kids in the fourth quarter did a great job of guarding, keeping people in front of them, uh, playing with some physicality. Coach Pop says the rookies provided the only bright spot in last night's loss to Brooklyn in big board sports. Last night, the Spurs got blown out in Brooklyn, and it all started with a poor first quarter. The Nets dropped 41 points on the Spurs, lead 41-22 after one. Brooklyn made 14 of 25 field goals and four of eight from three-point range to blow the game open early. They led from start to finish and by as many as 33 points in beating the Spurs 139 to 120. It got so bad, Pop let three rookies, Luka Samanich, Quindary Weatherspoon, and Keldon Johnson loose in the fourth quarter. And once again, Pop not pleased with the starting five. Our, our starting group is really soft defensively, and uh, that's pretty much been uh, tough most of the year. Uh, so if another team starts out and helps us by not making shots or whatever, then the defense doesn't look as bad. But uh, if they come out and they're scoring the way that the Nets did tonight, uh, then you, you see uh, the hole we get into. We get into that hole quite often. Spurs will play at the Cavaliers tomorrow night at 6.30. LaMarcus is out again with a right shoulder sprain. In men's college basketball, Texas at Oklahoma State, the Horns five-game winning streak on the line. The Cowboys dominated the first half. Lindy Waters, the third, steals the ball from Andrew Jones, and Waters throws it down. The state leads 13-3. They led by as many as 20 points in the first half. Four minutes to go now. Kai Jones makes noise with a powerful slam dunk for Texas. They trailed 43-21 at halftime, and Texas falls 81-59 in their regular season finale. Baylor at West Virginia. Before the game, Mountaineers senior Chase Harlow proposed to his girlfriend, Lindsey Barker. They've been together since the eighth grade. She said yes. Now, Harlow went scoreless, but he was still all smiles. Second half, Bears are pushing the pace. Devontae Bandu draws contact scores and the foul. Bears lead 37-30. West Virginia comes back. Miles McBride throws down a one-handed jam, and West Virginia upsets number four Baylor 76 to 64. Senior day up in Lubbock, Texas Tech hosting number one Kansas. The home fans all kinds of pumped up. First half, Tech on the run off a of Kansas miss. Ramsey feeds Terrence Shannon Jr., who weaves around a defender for a slam dunk. Tech led 19-18, but trailed 32-24 at halftime. Second half, 11 minutes to go. Kevin McCuller from Wagner grabs the miss and puts it back, and the Red Raiders lead 44-43. He had seven points, but Kansas would prevail behind Udoka Az Zabuki put back jam, and the Jayhawks hold on 66 to 62 to win the Big 12 regular season championship. San Antonio FC opening the 2020 season at home with Real Monarchs SLC. Second half, 67th minute, Blake Smith chips the ball in. Luis Solanac drills it, and Cal Montgomery is there for the finish for SAFC's first goal of the season. And SAFC knocks off the defending USL championship title. Holders 1-0. Picking up three points, that's a great way to start the season. Absolutely, and the win at home. Yep. All right, thanks, Larry. We'll be back.